Hello, this is Douglas Hoy, CEO of the National Community Pharmacist Association. Today, the historic Rutledge versus PCMA case was heard at the Supreme Court. Following up on yesterday's Facebook Live broadcast, we're here to share our impressions and get expert legal analysis. Here with me are John Vinson, the CEO of the Arkansas Pharmacists Association, Becky Sneed, the Executive Director and CEO of the National Alliance of State Pharmacy Associations, and Scott Kinnair, the Executive Director and CEO of the American Pharmacists Association. We're also joined by Tiffany Wright. Tiffany is an attorney from the law firm Oric, and Tiffany actually clerked with Justice Sotomayor and sat with Justice Kavanaugh on the DC circuit. So her perspective is going to be especially uh, enlightening. So let's jump right in. John, would you share with the audience your impressions of today of the, of the hearing today? Yeah, thank you, Doug. Glad to be here. It's been a long time coming. We're very excited that we've made it to this point to get through the arguments. It's such a rare thing for that to happen. Uh, can't wait to hear the legal analysis and breakdown a little bit later from Tiffany. I think she's going to be able to share some wonderful information with our audience about what she heard in the case. I would just say, uh, you know, one of the things that stood out to me just from an Arkansas perspective, I really like Nick Brawny getting those words in about Gillette, Arkansas and Hampton, Arkansas. You know, there's a single pharmacy in Calhoun County and that pharmacy goes out of business. It's literally a 30 minute drive in any direction to another pharmacy. So this case is, you know, in its simplest terms, it's about healthcare, it's about lives. We're in a pandemic and there's no time like now to have access to preferred providers in your local community. So excited to hear what happens in the case. Thanks, John. Becky, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with John. And I think that what is just really um, so remarkable to me, in, in addition to the fact that the United States Supreme Court accepted the case, is that, you know, we've been in this journey at state pharmacy associations on behalf of our patients for decades. Um, and to actually be able to get some clarity um, on behalf of um, all of our 50 state pharmacy associations and our national partners that have been fighting this fight for so very, very long. Um, you know, I just think I want to underscore, and I think it was appreciated in some of the remarks, that this was not um, a new or um, uh, issue that, 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 that came before them. It was something that had been percolating for decades. And, um, you know, the fact that we had 45 state attorney generals, as well as the majority of the state pharmacy associations signing on to the amicus brief really shows that this is not an Arkansas only issue. This is a nationwide issue that um, we are very, very happy that they, um, they heard. And we're excited to hear their ruling um, and also Tiffany's um, expert thoughts. Great, thanks Becky. Scott? Absolutely Doug, thanks. I tell you, I'm, I'm so proud of our team. Now I can't wait to get to <clears throat> Tiffany because I am not a lawyer. Uh, you know, from my perspective, so I'm gonna be brief so we can get to the meat of this, but, but the Solicitor General in the state of Arkansas did a great job arguing on behalf of pharmacists and pharmacy and patients everywhere. Now everything's out there. Everything we've been saying for years about the broken PDM model has been heard by the highest court in the land. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. And again, I can't wait to hear from Tiffany, but this was a great day from pharmacy. There's no going back now. Pharmacists and patients, we, we need a win here, uh, but win or lose, we're gonna have a lot of work to do, right? Uh, if we win, we work with states, uh, Becky and, and NASMA and, and all you guys work with states to change laws. Uh, but if we lose, we, we, we don't stop, we just change tactics. Now, you know, it was, uh, you know, the PBMs, we know they're transparent and they try to use uh, non-transparent tactics and they, that's kind of what they did today, right? Uh, arguing that oversight of our payments complex and complicated, when in fact, it's their lack of transparency in gaming that creates complexity and the unlevel playing field. So the other side says it's too complex to regulate prices differently across the states. That's, that's a ridiculous statement. They apply different, unfair, and egregious pricing schemes to pharmacies that are across the street from each other. So that's what I think, but Tiffany, you are an attorney. You have uh, clerked with some of these folks. 
So, man, please tell us. Uh, again, fingers crossed. There are some stuff, some questions. You know, they tried to talk about co-pays and shift stuff, but uh, you know, overall, I'm I'm hopeful. But I can't wait. I can't wait. So I'm going to shut up now. Tiffany, what we got? Well, actually, I'm next, Scott. Sorry, so Doug. I'll give Tiffany. I'm sorry. Time. I'm sorry. So, one more, uh, just a two more minutes before we get to hear Tiffany. Um, I thought that um, you know we heard a lot from the PBMs of their typical two arguments, which are fear and costs are going to go up. And the way that it was painted is that there's going to be chaos in the streets because, oh my gosh, states are going to have the authority to actually regulate plans within their own borders. Oh no, but that's the way it was painted. And then of course the other tired argument that the PBMs use that was trotted out again is, oh, costs are going to go up. Oh my gosh, we're going to bankrupt the entire country um, because costs are going to go up. And it's the same argument they've been using for, for decades. And I guess I'm really optimistic. I mean, <laughs> these brilliant people, uh, obviously, on, on the bench. I hope that they saw through those arguments. And I thought that uh, the team from the US Solicitor General's office, I thought Fred Liu was uh, amazing. Uh, he was uh, really fantastic. And I thought uh, Nick Brawny, the Arkansas Solicitor General, was excellent. Um, I loved how he closed. Um, at the end saying that, look, if we take this to an extreme, there'll be no state oversight on, on anything. And he used um, minimum wage laws as an example of, look, I mean, if we take this to an extreme, there can't even be minimum wage laws as an example of just how extreme this could be interpreted. So I thought um, it was a powerful argument from, um, from the Rutledge side and kind of the same, same old, same old from, um, the other side. So we're, we're optimistic. And like has been said, there's going to be a lot more work to do after this, no matter which way it comes out. But um, we're, we're very optimistic. <clears throat> but as, as all of us have said, we're anxious to hear what the legal expert has to say. So, so Tiffany, could you tell us what, what you thought about the case? What was your impression? Well, I agree with all of you that the Solicitor General for Arkansas, as well as the Solicitor General's Office for the United States, the Deputy SG um, or Assistant SG Fred Lou did an amazing job. I think this is a case that is, it involves a lot of seriously important issues. And so we have federalism concerns, what the states have the rights to regulate. We have statutory interpretation concerns, what it means to interpret a statute, whether you look at the purpose or the text. And of course, the purpose of ERISA is a background in all of this. Thankfully, this is not a case that requires the justices to resolve or reconcile all of these important principles because there is a case that directly governs um, travelers, which is a case that came up a lot in court in the argument this morning. And I thought both advocates um, for the, the respective solicitor general's offices did a great job at turning those two arguments about cost and uniformity on their head and saying, well, really, under the court's prior precedent, those arguments do not help um, the PMB the side of things because, you know, cost, for example, is something that states have historically been able to regulate. And in fact, Travelers speaks directly to that. And as for uniformity, I believe it was Fred Liu, who amazing argument pointed out that that doesn't exist in the abstract. The question is whether or not this causes disuniformity for central plan benefits, and it just simply does not here. And so I agree with the cautious optimism. Um, the advocates did an amazing job this morning, and I don't think that the other side did themselves any favors in the arguments that they, weighed, that they made this morning. We like hearing that. <laughs> there are there some, some questions for Tiffany from, from the CEO panel here? No. Can I ask a question, Tiffany? It's John. What do you think about, I've seen some early social media response from the pharmacists who were keying in on words that might have been used. What do you think about the Chief Justice calling or asking about the Byzantine practices of PBM pricing? I think that um, could cut either way. Um, I think that the complexity of it very often, and you saw this in what Mr. Waxman did this morning, a lot of advocates before the Supreme Court really you know, throw up the specter of the horrible nature of complexity, right? To say to the court that you shouldn't do anything to make this more complex. And so you saw Mr. Waxman focus on the complexity of the MAC um, tables, the complexity of the different appeal processes and procedures, and the Chief Justice picked up on that. Um, but again, I think 
Mr. Liu went directly for that issue when he said that any state law, of course, anytime the state regulates anything, it injects a measure of disuniformity among the states. And this is by its very nature a Byzantine process. Um, ERISA is a very complex statute. All of the regulations that go into it are complex, but the question before the court in this case is whether or not this is something that states should be able to regulate. Um, and I'm hopeful that even the Chief Justice would agree that this is something, um, despite the Byzantine nature of it, that states have traditionally been able to regulate and should continue to do so. If, I mean, Doug, oh, go ahead, I, I had a question for, for Tiffany. Tiffany, you know, I don't feel this is a left or right thing, right, with the court, and, um, but you know, you, you've studied folks, you know how they rule in other, other cases and sort of what their history is. What do you think, uh, you know, the numbers are? You know, we got, we got eight, we need five, right? Uh, help me with my math. <laughs> so um, thankfully we do have a fair amount of information about a number of the justices and how they voted in the past. Um, you mentioned that this is an eight member court. I think that's important um, because um, of course, if the court were to split 4-4, that would result in an affirmance by an equally divided court. Um, and so we want to avoid that. As always, we definitely want to count to five. And I think that there is a real possibility that we are able to get there. Um, the most interesting justice in terms of this area of the law, I think is Justice Thomas. I was very happy to hear his voice in asking questions this morning. Um, you, you may know that he famously does not ask questions. I think that this new um, telephonic argument sort of puts him in a position to ask questions because he's specifically called on by the Chief Justice and so we've heard him speaking up more. I think his questions today um, show how interesting he is in this area. So Justice Thomas um, really focuses on the language of the ERISA preemption provision which he calls the broadest in all of the federal law um, and he thinks that that is a real problem because of course the Constitution gives Congress or grants supreme status to only the laws that Congress had authority to regulate, only the laws that go to areas where Congress has historically had authority to regulate. Um, and so if the Congress does not have authority to regulate in a specific area, federal law cannot trump state law in that area. And so when we talk about a risk of preemption, um, Congress does that pursuant to its commerce power. And so to the extent that that very broad ERISA language exceeds Congress's authority, um, Justice Thomas would say that the, that, the con that there is no trumping of the state law, and so states have power to regulate. Um, we saw him write about this in his concurring opinion in Gobey, which was a case that was mentioned a ton this morning. Um, and his decision there really um, gives us really a lot of room to think and be hopeful that he will ultimately decide um, that this is an area where states' rights govern. Um, Justice Gorsuch um, wrote some preemption opinions when he was on the 10th Circuit. Um, that and, and some of his votes on the Supreme Court also suggest that he might agree with Justice Thomas that when you take an exceedingly broad preemption provision and stack that against um, what it does to the state's power to regulate um, in areas of their traditional authority, Justice, Tom Justice Gorsuch might agree with Justice Thomas. The same is true for Justice Kavanaugh. Um, we have less clues into how Justice Kavanaugh might think because he only had two preemption opinions on the DC circuit, neither of them particularly relevant here, um, but his votes in the short time he's been on the court um, suggest that he might agree with Justice Thomas on this. Justice Sotomayor is another interesting vote. She, of course, dissented in Gobey where the court um, said that a state law was, was preempted. She dissented from that. And so that gives us reason to think that she might agree with us here. Um, Justice Kagan has been quieter, and so we have less clues, but I think her questioning this morning really demonstrates that she might agree that this is, the way to resolve this is just by applying travelers to say um, that this is a, a regulation of costs, which has been permitted, or a regulation of PBMs, which is not the regulation of a plan. Um, and so the three that I think we have to worry about, um, Justice Breyer, the chief, Justice and Justice Alito um, have not been as favorable to state regulation and are more likely to find preemption based on some of their prior votes. Justice Breyer, I think that came through in his questioning this morning, he's very concerned about uniformity um, and the, the prospect of a state, um, various states having their own requirements is something he's very concerned about. 
And so that was a long winded way of saying that I think if you count the votes here, um, we can get to five, um, even if we lost the three justices about which there is some concern, Justices Breyer, Alito, and the Chief Justice, we would still have five. Um, and their prior opinions and votes really give us cl clues on how they'll get there. Yeah, we're not in Vegas, but what are, what are the odds here? You got good odds. I, I'd give you, if I had to throw out a number, about an 80% shot. Eight, eight zero? Eight zero. <laughs> right. What about, uh, Tiffany, can you comment on if, um, Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed, what impact that might have on a decision? So justices can only vote in arguments in cases where they sat for the argument. Um, and so the confirmation of Justice Barrett, potentially a Justice Barrett after the case has already been argued, she would not um, vote on the decision. Now there is precedent for um, the case, the last time this happened when Justice Scalia died and Justice Gorsuch joined the court, there were two cases where the court held re-argument um, to allow for Justice Gorsuch's vote. That is likely to happen if the, case, if the court thinks that it cannot reach a decision. Um, I think that's unlikely here. Mm. Um, and, but if, if the only way for justice, a potential Justice Barrett to have a vote in this case would be if the case were reheard, um, and that would be a decision um, that would be made after she is confirmed. Great, thank you. Scott, you had another question? Yeah, I do, I do. So, so Tiffany, so is this limited or is this big? Does a, a win in this case, you know, uh, settle the question of whether states can sue PP or can regulate, not sue PBMs? I mean, is this, you know, very narrow or is this a, I, I hope it's a big deal, right? So where is it on the scale? I think it would be a win for the multiple states that are regulating PBMs right now. Of course, it's very difficult to say um, what the scope of the opinion would be, the scope of the when depends on the scope of the opinion. And so very often, um, particularly one thing I'd like to say about an eight member court, when the court is in this posture where they know they have eight, they are very motivated to decide cases and not let them split four four. And so that dynamic could result in all sorts of compromises and um, agreements that could affect the scope of the ultimate opinion. You saw that in Justice Kagan's questioning about whether or not this, the, the rule that comes from this case could just be limited to this being a regulation of PBMs um, and the fact that it doesn't touch plans. And so I think the ultimate effect um, and how big of a win it would be will depend on how the court writes the opinion. But in, I, in any case, um, a decision that states may regulate PBMs would be a huge win for Arkansas and the other states that are currently doing so. And for, of course, um, everyday citizens who need to have access to pharmacies and to their medications, it would be a win. Yes, absolutely. John, you have a question? I do. What do you think about the significance of some of the discussion about, we have to think back to when the law was written and could the law have ever, ever even been imagined to apply to an industry that didn't exist or if it did exist, it certainly didn't exist in the way it exists today you know, and the whole reason we even passed this law in the first place. I know there was some line of questioning in that realm, and I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. I do. So that questioning came from Justice Alito, um, who I would put in the category of justices where there is some area of concern, because Justice Alito, um, very much like Justice Thomas, but as I said, Justice Thomas has competing interests or, or views in this case, but Justice Alito believes very strongly and sticking not just to um, the purpose of the statute or what was imagined, but to the words. And the problem with this ERISA preemption provision is that it is so broad. Justice Scalia famously wrote about it and said that everything relates to everything. And so a statute that says anything that relates to has no limiting principle. Um, and so that I think is the fundamental problem with the statutory language. And I don't think this is a case that's gonna turn on um, as some recent cases have, sort of going back and seeing whether the drafters of this statute had envisioned PBMs and what and how complex this whole area of um, regulation would become. Um, I think that this will turn, um, frankly, on travelers and to the extent that the statutory language becomes relevant, it will be as it was um, interpreted in that case. But um, I thought that was an interesting discussion. And frankly, I think that's a, fe a feature of the new way that the court is doing argument, 
And so when it's not a free for all as it normally is, and justices are put on the spot, like ask a question right now, um, you tend to get some of these more theoretical questions um, yeah. that allow the justices to really just have fun. Um, and I think that this was perhaps an example of that, although Justice Alito will stick closely to the statutory language, but I don't think it'll, we will see an opinion that tries to imagine if um, PBMs had existed at the time that ERISA was written, what that would have meant. Um, but very interesting discussion. So, Tiffany, you've, you've been, you were a law clerk for Justice Sotomayor, and you've been in those back rooms. Can, can you tell us about the process? You know, so they've heard the case. What kind of, how do they come to a conclusion and how does that work? So the justices will meet on Friday uh, to discuss the cases that they heard today, including our case, and to discuss the cases that they hear tomorrow. Um, the justices meet in private. No one else is present. Um, no other staff members of the court, including the clerks. Um, and the chief justice will speak first and they proceed in seniority order. So the chief justice will start by saying how he will vote and very briefly why. Um, and then they will go down the line until they get to Justice Kavanaugh, who's the most junior. After that is made, um, I hope that we have a unanimous win here and so there isn't a dissent. But if, for example, there's a majority and a dissent, um, the most senior justice who is voting with the majority assigns who will write the opinion in that case. The chief justice is always considered the most senior, even if he is not technically the most senior by number of years. So if he's in the majority, he will make the assignment. The most senior justice in the dissent will decide who writes the dissent. The justices will then communicate what has happened at conference to their clerks in most chambers, um, with the exception of um, Actually, in all chambers, the, the clerks will take the first stab at the draft. Different justices, you know, Justice Kagan famously trashes that draft and doesn't pay as much attention to it as other justices, but the clerks will draft, their justice will review, the chambers will come up with a final opinion. That opinion is circulated to the other um, seven or eight members of the court. Um, all of the justices by old fashioned memo. Um, will debate various parts of the opinion if they have objections, a final opinion will be produced, and that is what the public will see. Um, there is no timetable for this. A lot of it depends on how quick some justices write opinions more quickly than others, um, but they have until June when the term ends. Um, and so no matter what, we will know how this case is decided by June of next year. Great. Just one quick question related to that. So on the Hill, on Capitol Hill, they talk about, I mean, our fly-in we have every year, and we often say that it's the, the, the 25 to 30 year olds, um, you know, in the Hill offices who kind of run the world, so to speak. What role do the clerks have with the justices? Is it the same kind of uh, influence or what we perceive perceived influence? No, I mean, I think, you know, perhaps clerks like to think of themselves as, as far more important than they ultimately are. All of these justices are tremendous, like just brilliant, which is why they're justices. And so, yes, the clerks have a lot of influence in, you know, deciding the cert process, for example, deciding and making recommendations on what cases will be granted. In this process, the clerk's um, influence is really limited to, you know, crafting that first, the first draft of the opinion. They, of course, wrote a memo that helped get their justice ready for argument this morning. Um, and really playing an advisory role to the justice. Um, but at least in my chambers, and I think in all others, Justice Sotomayor was always very clear that there's one boss here um, and she disagreed with her clerks and she wins. And so I think the clerks are advisors, um, important advisors certainly, but um, it's not the case that the clerks are actually running the building. The justices are, are very much in charge and often disagree with, with us, so. Very good, thanks. That's very insightful, that's very interesting. There are other questions that we have for, for Tiffany. What, could I make a comment, Doug? I was, uh, <clears throat> I was a little surprised there wasn't more conversation about the regulatory vacuum, that if they're not regulated at the state level, well, they're not really regulated under ERISA either because they're not fiduciaries. I was a little surprised that there wasn't 
much discussion about that, about the complete lack of regulation. I've got my president, Teddy Roosevelt, bobblehead doll here because he was the trust buster. And when we passed legislation in Arkansas, our governor stood in front of 125 pharmacists at the Capitol in their white coats and said, what this industry is doing is similar to what the railroads were doing when Teddy Roosevelt was president. And he was, he was eventually supportive of signing the legislation because it's not right the way their businesses operate against local providers and taking away choice by patients. And I know the case is maybe not that broad, you know, in the minds of the justices, but I was, I was a little surprised there wasn't more discussion about if we reverse this, you know, there's going to be no oversight of this $500 billion industry, which is now a trillion dollar industry because of the vertical integration. I, I think um, that that might, I, I noticed that as well. I expected, honestly, that that would be one of the points made on rebuttal, um, given the extent to which Mr. Waxman um, sort of walked into that argument, um, but it didn't come up. But I'll say that I think these arguments are so different because I don't think we can over overstate the effect of these arguments being heard by telephone. And so when you're standing in front of the justices in normal time, there's more of a, a free for all and all of these sort of policy arguments are more likely to come up. But in the format that we saw today, um, it, 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 calls, it makes for weird outcomes where things that you expect to be mentioned really aren't. But I, I as well was um, expected to hear that. I think that, that would have put a nice seal on things at the end. But you know, it, this, these, are, these are weird times for Supreme Court arguments. Well, and it's a, it's a weird year. 2020 is a weird year <laughs> overall, um, but we hope we don't get a weird outcome. We hope we get the outcome that we're all um, hoping for, optimistic for, not only for our, our pharmacies that we represent, but for the patients that we take care of, um, that our members take care of. So Tiffany, we thank you very, very much for your um, insight and expertise. And I wanna thank my colleagues, um, Becky, John, Scott, for, for being here with us today. And for the, as you can see, that there's been a lot of uh, camaraderie that's gone into uh, this case. It's very important to all of um, the profession. So with that, we wanna thank our audience and um, we'll all be watching this very, very closely to, uh, awaiting that final decision. So again, thank you everyone and um, have a good afternoon, evening, night whenever you're watching this. Thanks, Doug. Thanks. Thank Bye you. Bye, everyone.